The word gospel means good news, and it comes from the Greek word euangelion, from which we get the English word evangelist. An evangelist is someone who tells good news, and for Christians, that good news is the incarnation, life, ministry, crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Anyone who tells the story of God's love for us in Jesus is considered to be an evangelist, because as the church understands it, Jesus Christ is himself good news for all creation. The four gospel books of the New Testament are four tellings of that good news written by four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each tell the story of Jesus' life, ministry, crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And these texts were all written down some 40 years after Jesus' resurrection, for many reasons. First, it was common for these stories in the text to be spoken orally and passed down from generation to generation by retelling this good news in various groups of people. Forty years after Jesus, many of the eyewitnesses who saw Jesus' ministry, who were present at the time of his resurrection, who, who testified and told the, the, the story of the good news as it was happening, many of these people were dying off. Uh, either because of old age or because of the persecution that the church was facing at the time. And so the Christian communities of the world recognized a need to preserve these stories so that others could hear them, because those who were telling them weren't around anymore. Also, as the church grew and missionaries spread the good news to other portions of the world, they wanted to have a way to share their stories with others and leave them for as many people to hear as they could as they would then travel on to the next town. A copied gospel text was a lot easier to leave and revisit by the people of that community and offered a consistent witness to the good news everywhere that that evangelist traveled. There were many gospel texts recorded throughout the early history of the church but the four that we have here in the New Testament endure because their consistent focus on Jesus and his resurrection, their, their congruence with one another, and the different perspectives that each evangelist presents as a dis different aspect of, of who Jesus really is offers to us who come now some 2,000 years later a glimpse into who God is and what God does for us in Jesus. The oldest of the four Gospels is Mark. Uh, we have those uh, earliest manuscripts preserved um, from him. Matthew and Luke seem to have used Mark as a basis for their own Gospels, which uh, tells us now, some 2,000 years removed, that um, Matthew and Luke and Mark's faith communities probably told a lot of the same stories to one another and when it came time to write them down they were they were using mark's gospel which like i said is the first as a template for how they would then add the other stories that were particular to their community um, there are many differences in these four texts only matthew and luke tell of the stories of jesus's birth which we celebrate at christmas and they both have different perspectives of that event Mark and John's Gospels um, start the story with Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan and his ministry then in Galilee. The, the beginning of their Gospels is the beginning of Jesus' formal ministry on earth. The parables and the teachings differ between the four texts. And while some may overlap, others only appear maybe once in the four Gospels in one of those texts. But like I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to be the closest to one another. The, the chronology and the overlapping stories and the parables show that these communities shared much of the same teachings about who Jesus is and how his ministry shapes us into God's people. Uh, but the Gospel of John is a little bit different. The early church actually didn't allow new converts to learn or read from that Gospel until after they had been exposed to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke because it's so different.
John's focus is on Jesus' divinity made flesh and how Jesus reveals to us in his person and in his teachings who God is. Um, there's a lot of divine imagery and revelation in these teachings that are recorded by John, which we can only begin to understand by knowing the core teachings of the other three Gospels. It's like rewatching a movie, right? The more you dive into it, the more things you encounter that you may have missed the first go-round. And so uh, to, to help new converts to the faith grow in a way that wasn't too fast for them, but also in a way that was consistent with what the church taught, because of John's divine imagery, your mind can just go 20 different ways at once. Um, they, they, they taught new converts the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then once they had been received into the church, then explored with them the Gospel of John and all that that opens up to us about who God is and what God does for us in Jesus. Um, there are four images that are attributed to each of these four Gospels that are based on a prophecy from Ezekiel and uh, of, of four divine creatures. And these four divine creatures also appear in a vision that John received in the book of Revelation. And there are many interpretations as to which evangelist is which divine creature, but the most common is what I'm going to share with you right now, and it has to do with how each gospel text begins and how they represent the perspectives each of these four evangelists has of the universal Jesus, right? Because as you tell a story, how you set yourself up then leads us to understand where it is you're going. And by the time you get to the end, you look back to the beginning and you say, oh, this is the message they're trying to communicate. So Matthew's uh, divine creature, divine symbol, is uh, the man. Because Matthew's gospel begins with a genealogy, a list of people. Matthew's telling of the good news focuses on how Jesus is the son of man, the, the prophesied Messiah or Savior of the Jewish covenant. Matthew's Gospel contains commentary on how Jesus fulfills Torah and prophecies, suggesting to us that Matthew's community was predominantly made up of Jewish Christians who would have been concerned with worshiping God, especially if God had somehow ignored the covenants of the past. And so the perspective that Matthew brings in telling his good news is that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and by being the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah for all of creation. Mark and his gospel uh, receives the image of the lion, uh, the lion roaring in the desert with prophetic power. As, as Mark's gospel begins, he's baptized by John in the wilderness and immediately goes out and he starts prophesying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Luke's gospel uh, receives the image of the ox because uh, Luke's gospel begins with uh, a temple sacrifice. Oxen are servant animals, uh, sometimes called beasts of burden. Uh, they're used mostly to bear the burden of plowing and harvesting in the field. And Luke shows uh, and tells us the good news of how Jesus is God's servant to the people, particularly the poor and the downcast who suffer unjustly and are brought to wholeness through Jesus, the servant. Um, Luke also has a lot of stories and parables which feature Gentiles or non-Jews who were considered to be inferior by the Jewish people of God's covenant. Luke's gospel turns that on its head, showing how Jesus is the priest for all people, drawing everyone into fellowship with God through the blessings that were given to Israel on behalf of the entire world. Uh, God sends Jesus to be the servant of all creation not just a particular set of people. And that brings us then to the Gospel of John, who receives the image of the eagle, flying heavenwards like the divine word. Um, the eagle is an ancient symbol of the divine, and John's Gospel uses imagery and illusion to describe the ministry and the work of Jesus. Where the other Gospels use miracles and teachings to inform us how to live as Jesus' disciples, John's Gospel uses divine imagery to particularly and primarily show who Jesus is. Uh, who is this Jesus? Where did he come from? Why is he here? Um, and how Jesus is himself God. 
the word made flesh, the, the light of all creation, the bread of life, all of these images which reach back to the Old Testament for uh, how the people have called upon God in the past, but also how Jesus is those things for us now. Where the other three Gospels explore uh, who God is through inference and requiring the hearer to connect the dots. John connects the dots for us in a way that explores the mystery of the divine more directly. And that's another reason why John was kind of um, held off as uh, a higher level of incorporation into the church. Um, they didn't want to throw that at you right out of the gate. And even with these different perspectives, right, there are many similarities between these four Gospels. Each Gospel um, contains references to Jesus' baptism, to his ministry in Galilee, uh, and how he called disciples to follow him. Um, each Gospel retells a story of the feeding of the 5,000, for instance. We have the story of Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain where Elijah and Moses appear with him. Uh, and each gospel, most importantly, tells us the story of Jesus' passion, which include his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday, Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Above all, these evangelists wanted to communicate the same thing. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who draws us closer to God and frees us from the grave through the forgiveness of sin and the resurrection from the dead. And the differences in their stories help us to explore more deeply how those promises transform the entirety of our life in more than just one way. So the question that comes up, of course, is why are there four Gospels, right? Why not blend them all together into one, uh, fix some of the, the inconsistencies that come with different perspectives to offer one cohesive, solid telling of the good news that all Christians can learn from? Well, the reason for that is because these texts were recordings of oral traditions, right? They, they contain different stories about Jesus and his ministry, some with different details that don't always line up if you were trying to make a singular timeline. Part of that is because different communities focus on different stories, right? Just like the memories that you tell in your own household may be slightly different than the ones told in your neighbor's household. That, of course, doesn't mean that these conflicting stories are made up. It means that people learn different lessons from the same event and tell the story in a way that focuses on the lessons they learned and the lessons they want to pass on to someone else. Like watching a movie with your friends, right? Your own perspective will be different from theirs because the things that have shaped you throughout your life to be the person who you are today are going to be different than the things that have shaped your friends. And so... All of that is going to influence what you see, what you hear, what you experience in any given group, even if you're all experiencing the same thing at the same time. Um, there's a story that comes out of India, and it's one of their uh, like uh, teaching parables or, or proverbs. And uh, the story goes that this king brought an elephant into his court uh, with, with no one around and brought in different members of his advisory group and brought them in blindfolded and walked them up to this elephant and said, I want you to, to, to touch and feel your way around and describe what it is you're feeling. And so the first one came in blindfolded and felt around and felt this long leathery thing and kind of jumped back a little bit and said, I feel a snake. And took that one out, brought the next one in blindfolded and said, feel and, and, and tell me and describe what it is you're feeling. And, and felt and, and felt this large, massive thing and said, it feels like a tree trunk, right? And so then the next one came in and uh, felt and felt this long, hard, sharp uh, thing that they couldn't really describe. And said, there's got to be like a spear or something. And then the next one came in and, of course, felt and felt this long... Uh, almost like rope that was braided and frayed at the end. 
And of course, what they're describing are the, the elephant's trunk and leg and tusks and tail. It's all the same elephant, but they're at different places perceiving different things. And so when you come away to tell the story of what you've experienced, of course they're going to be different, even if you're describing the exact same thing. Um, the early church included all four of these texts as they are preserved for us into the canon of Scripture because each community needs to hear the four perspectives that these evangelists offer to us. The four different perspectives is the good news of how Jesus transforms the entirety of our lives. And that is best done when all four evangelists are working together for the glory of God. They weren't concerned with historical accuracy like we are today. They were concerned with telling the good news and what that means for all who hear it. Everything that we, we say, everything that we do in Jesus' name is measured by what the good news of the gospel teaches us about who God is and what God does for us in Jesus. Right? Even though there are four books, our lives are also witnesses to the good news because we've experienced the good news of Jesus in our own life and we're called to share the good news of Jesus with our every breath. Um, Lutherans, particularly in the early days of the movement, right, called themselves evangelists because Luther and his collaborators based their ministry on the, the central focus of the gospel. What does Jesus do for us, and what does that mean about the world in which we live? Uh, more so than the, the canon laws or the teachings or the traditions or the thoughts and the opinions of popes and cardinals. What does the story of Jesus do to shape our life for the better because God loves us and sent Jesus for us? And for this reason, our worship centers on readings from Scripture, right? The, the proclaimed telling of the good news that we find during a sermon time and our reception of the good news through Holy Communion. Because as people of the good news, we are grounded in the gospel that Jesus rose from the dead for us and forgives us our sin because of his love for us. Right, think back to the last time that you, uh, you attended a worship service. Of all the readings that we hear on a Sunday morning, there's a reason that we stand up to hear the gospel. Because we want to be ready to have it transform us from head to toe. To celebrate what God has done for us in Jesus and to be prepared by God to go out into the world sharing the good news with the world, just as the evangelists of the early church have done for us. And it's for that reason that I think so many of us are familiar with the stories of the gospel. Because any time that Christians gather, primarily at a time for worship, there's always a reading from one of the gospel texts. We hear them and we read them and we we are, are washed over by them more than any of the other texts of Scripture. And there's good reason for that. Because in the gospel, in the good news, we encounter Jesus, who is, as we say around Christmas time, God with us. And so in the spirit of God's good news given to us in Jesus, I ask now, people of God, will you pray with me? Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life, which you have given us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, your good news for all of creation, in whose name we pray. Amen.